Today we're going to look at writing habits. The good, the bad and the utterly ridiculous. I'm going to share with you my own writing habits and give you examples of what are bad habits you must definitely avoid, the good habits that can really help you to be more productive and the just plain ridiculous things that I'll share with you at the end about how I actually write. So we'll look at the habits that make for stronger writing, more productive hours spent at your desk, how can you do the things that are really going to make you begin, continue through and finish that book. Um, and we'll look at habits that maybe really work against you and things that you can avoid. And at the end, I will share with you some of my own slightly more surprising writing habits. Um, and I'd like to find out if you have any little superstitions or um, little quirks that you find you have to adhere to when you're writing things that little jinxes if you don't do them and stuff like that. So we'll have a look at those too. But for now, we're going to look at, first of all, the good. So here are the good writing habits. First good habit to get into is read. Become a book bug, bookworm. Read. It doesn't matter what you read. It really doesn't. If you read bad stuff, you'll begin to see that it's bad. And that's good, because then you'll know how not to write. So read. Don't worry about reading infecting your own writing with a, a style or, or anything like that. You need to feel how stories work. You need to see all the different ways that you could express a story. Um, and you can learn by other people's mistakes and save yourself a lot of time. So first good habit is read. A second good habit is listen. Become an eavesdropper. Um, listen in on other people's conversations, on the bus, on the tube, um, when you're out shopping, anywhere you can, listen. Listen to how other people talk to each other. This is not just good for dialogue, it's good for seeing how people really relate to each other. So listen to what they don't say, listen to the subtext and how loud it is, even in conversations between people that maybe you don't know and you don't know the backstory. But if you listen hard, you can sense, you can read between those lines. So the second good habit is listen. The third good habit is watch. Become really observant, super observant. Um, watch how clouds form in the sky. Watch how people walk when they cross the street. Watch how somebody pulls a pint in a bar or waits at table. Watch how a bus driver looks at his the passengers on his bus, watch and observe closely and really commit to memory how people behave and what things look like when they change, particularly being able to capture that change. And if you can note those things down, you know, I'm, I'm taking for granted you carry some sort of note-taking device with you, whether it's a, a notebook or, or, or one of your, your, your phone or something like that, where you can jot down things that you've overheard, things that you've seen. So the third good habit is watch, okay? And the fourth good habit is write. Get on with it. There's an awful lot of procrastination which we'll come to in the bad habits, but really the habit forming thing of writing often. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it does have to be often. I'm sure you've heard people say write every day, and I know sometimes that's unrealistic and you have to do what works for you, but you do need to do it often. It's a bit like exercise. It's no good just sort of trying to cram it all into two days at the end of the week. Um, the habit of being involved in your story, of getting work down, of pushing through those times when, when it's difficult, it really does make it get easier. It will be easier to get through those difficult times the more you do it, like everything else, it's practice. So the fourth good habit is right, get on with it, okay? I've got three bad habits for you to look out for. Um, the first of these, and the most obvious, is procrastination. Don't put things off. It's so easy. We all think, well, I'll settle down to write when I've cleared up the kitchen. I'll settle down to write when I've walked the dog. Um, when I've got these bills paid and written these emails and all those sort of things, you can find writerly ways to procrastinate. Research, what has not been done in the name of research that has put off the actual writing. So be very wary of that. There are a lot of activities that you do need to do for your writing, um, like watching really helpful YouTube videos, um, researching your historical period if you're writing something um, set a long time ago, or, 
or coming up with those sort of ideas and being stimulated. So you need to, I don't know, go to an exhibition, um, go for a walk, all those activities that help your creativity. They're good, but watch out that you're not using them just to put off the business of writing. So don't procrastinate. Okay. Bad habit number two is self-doubt. We all get it. We get it about everything, not just writing, sadly. But it is something that you just have to put to one side. You'll get those days when you think, nobody's going to read this. And if they do read it, my goodness, what are they going to think? I'm not good enough. My writing's not good enough. I'll never get there. I can't do it. Um, somebody else will do it better than me. That self-doubt is crippling. That's why the cliche exists. Have nothing to do with it. Just acknowledge it. Okay, think of it as a little cloud going through the sky, your nice blue sky thinking, along comes a very grubby black cloud. That's self-doubt, and just watch it go past. It will pass, it will go, and you're gonna just ignore it and let it get on with it. Because it's gonna be there, it's gonna be part of your writing life that you will doubt what you do. And the really hard thing to accept is that you doubt it at all stages. You doubt it when you're pre-published, you doubt it when you're starting something, you doubt it when you've finished it and you send it to someone, you doubt it when you've written it. Even when people have liked it and it's been quite successful, you doubt that you'll be able to do it again. So it never goes away. So if you know it's never going to go away, you might as well learn how to live with it. And for me, it's that little smudgy cloud thing. Clouds move through the sky. Eventually, they go somewhere else. So just let it pass, okay? Self-doubt bad habit number two. Bad habit number three. Now I'm calling this algorithm agony. Two years ago I didn't know what an algorithm was, I doubt you did either. It, it, what is this thing? We're supposed to understand algorithms for Facebook, for YouTube, for Instagram, for everything. I mean, you know, life presumably has algorithms attached to it now. I, I don't understand what they are. I thought algae was something green and slimy and rhythms had nothing to do with machinery or devices or mathematics. It was all way over my head. And now we have to worry that there's some system working against us the whole time. And it's really easy to blame the system if you're not getting anywhere. If you're not getting any progress, you can say, well, the, the whole system of publishing is against me, whether it's self-publishing and never being discoverable on Amazon because there are three million other books and a lot of them are self-published and there's nobody there to help you. Or if it's traditional publishing and there's all the traditionally published people that have gone before you who have a reputation, maybe your editor is making you lack confidence or maybe your marketing people haven't put enough of a budget in for what you're doing or that they control the budget but you know what I mean it's easy to think that the system you're in is what's holding you back well here's the thing those are the systems we've got whether they have algorithms or whether they don't I'll never know all I know is if you blame that stuff if you just sit there and go well this game is really hard and the rules are not fair and it's all stacked against me well you might as well go and do something else and you'll probably find that there are rules and unfairnesses attached to that too so don't let yourself get into the bad habit of algorithm agony okay you can beat it just keep going just do your thing all right so now i'm going to share with you the utterly ridiculous in the way of writing habits and i'm only going to do this if you promise to do this with yours okay i'll show you mine if you show me yours. So I have two or three probably utterly ridiculous writing habits. I'm not precious about what pen I use or what font I type in and that sort of stuff. Um, and I can more or less write anywhere if I have to, as long as I can't hear my own children squabbling, I can get on with stuff. It can be in a train, it can be in a car. It's nicer to write in my shed or my writing cabin or somewhere like that, but I don't have a problem with that. But I do like to do certain things. One of the things I do is I like to sort of wear some of the clothes that my characters might be wearing, which is a little bit tricky because I write historical fiction, but you can get away with it. So, um, for instance, Xanthi, the, the character in my, my new series, The Little Shop of Found Things, she likes to wear vintage clothes. That's quite helpful. <laughs> a lot of my clothes are vintage without meaning to be. I'm vintage by now and I've had them a long time. So she might wear a tweed jacket with a tea dress and Doc Martin boots, that would be very typical for her. And guess what? <laughs> I've started wearing these things. I think my family just relieved I've moved out of the 17th century, really. Um, so yes, one of my odd little habits is that I do like to sort of wear some of the stuff my characters 
might wear. I also start to use some of their speech patterns and I think that's a habit that is not really very surprising. Um, can be a little unsettling if people don't know what you do for a living. Um, and my family, again, a lot of eye rolling goes on there, but yes, I do sometimes start to use the speech patterns and voices of my characters. And the third little habit I have is I like to have a talisman. And I discovered just before I did this that the plural of talisman is not talismen, as you might think, it's talismans. So I like to have little things that are sort of symbols or lucky charms attached to my stories while I'm writing a book. And I'll show you a couple of those now, so bear with me. Okay, so this simple little bangle this is actually made of uh, horn, cow's horn, in fact. And this is something that I bought when I was writing The Winter Witch, because if you know the story of The Winter Witch, it's about <coughs> drovers. And one of the things the drovers did when they were moving cattle or sheep, um, hundreds, hundreds of miles through Britain to London, usually to where they were going to be sold, they made things that they could sell when they got there, apart from the, the livestock themselves. And this sort of thing is, is what they would have made. Um, you dehorn cattle, it's like taking you know fingernails off. It doesn't hurt them, um, but it makes them a bit easier to cope with. And, and so if they did dehorn them, they would make things out of the horn. You'll see often beakers, cups, things like that. You know, with the, the, um, Whalers used to do it with whale bone and walrus tusks and things, and, and drovers did it with, with uh, cattle horn and sheep's horn. So that is a little horn bracelet, and I bought that when I was writing The Winter Witch because it's all about the drovers and I like to wear it while I was writing the book. Taking lucky charms, taking lucky charms rather literally, I began to collect these rather splendid charms, if you can see those there. And most of these actually pertain to something to do with my book. So we've got here the frog prince, my little froggy. Um, my Gretel, Detective Gretel books are set um, around the idea of fairy tales, at least puns on fairy tales for the titles. So Frog Prince was actually not a prince, as in princess and prince, but as in pictures. But that Frog Prince was, was for that one. Um, okay, Winter Witch, again, those of you who've read The Winter Witch will know that it has corgis in it. And this is my little corgi, a little diamante collar, I'm not sure that uh, Megan and Bracken would have had collars like that. And this one is more publishing related, my little Dachshund, my little sausage dog. This is actually the emblem or the logo of my, my publisher. So Thomas Dunn, it's the imprint of St. Martin's in America. And their emblem is a little Dachshund, little sausage dog. So when I got my, my publishing contract with them, which was a really big event for me, um, I found that one. And, and this here is another one of my, my Gretel symbols, a little gingerbread house, because of course Hansel and Gretel were from <coughs> the original story with the gingerbread house, and it even opens up, and there's a little dog in there. And there is something about having these things that is just comforting, it just gives you confidence. And going back to that self-doubt thing, don't beat yourself up if you have utterly ridiculous writing habits, as long as they're not stopping you from writing, um, if they help you overcome the self-doubt, if they help you to banish those algorithm agonies where you're really worried about the system being stacked against you, then then it's okay to have them. You know, go for them, whatever helps you. So um, if you think other people might find this helpful or interesting, share this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, Let's know in the comments, what are your funny little writing habits? What are the things you absolutely can't do without? Okay, so good luck with your writing.